Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 354, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with Mr. Lawrence Schick, aka Mr. Lawrence Ellsworth. Now, Ellsworth is the uh, pseudonym that he uses when he's writing his swashbuckling tales, uh, which he has collected in various forms, as well as his uh, translation of Alexander Dumas' book, The Red Sphinx. Now, that is a sequel to the Three Musketeers novel that I'm sure uh, most of you probably have read. Uh, and it's previously been unavailable in English. Uh, so this is very exciting stuff. I know you want to hear all about it. Now, after that, I will be reading a chapter from my book, uh, Vintage Games 2.0, An Insider Look at the Most Influential Games of All Time. I'll be reading a chapter from this book about SimCity. Uh, so if you've been curious about my book, uh, please uh, stick around, listen to that, and you can decide whether this is a, a book you might want to read uh, for yourself. It's available at Amazon, as well, of course, the uh, CRC Press website. Uh, just look in the show notes to the links uh, for all that, as well as, of course, uh, Mr. Six stuff. Anyway, a lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Schick. Uh, so let's uh, transition once again, uh, Lawrence. Uh, you, you had said that, uh, that your experience with collaborative game writing uh, helps you with your translation uh, skills. I was very curious about that, uh, and I was wondering how helpful it was to you when you were translating Alexandre Dumas uh, from 19th century French to 21st century English. Uh, well, um, 19th century French is uh, a lot easier to understand than uh, than often than what a programmer is trying to tell you uh, in their language. Um, so, uh, uh, so having having worked with all these different disciplines uh, for many years uh, to uh, to collaborate on on creating a uh, uh, experience, you know, uh, working with a guy who's been dead for 150 years was. Uh, uh, wasn't all that different, uh, you know. There's, there's, uh, he. he uh, what was interesting about it was um, uh, trying to divine from from this different person in this different culture at a different time what he's getting at. Uh, and since what I do is create different cultures from from different people of different times. Uh, it, uh, it, it helped me to put myself in the position of, uh, of finding Alexander Dumas' mindset, what, how he was trying to tell his story, how he's trying to get it across, what's important to him uh, in this, um, uh, where, what are the parts that he obviously enjoyed and that, that he was clearly uh, really wanted to convey, uh, and then to try to take that and, and, and put that into a, uh, a 21st century uh, uh, accessible English uh, that uh, that anybody can enjoy um, without losing the feel of, uh, of of what he was what he's all about. Uh, that yeah, boy, that's fun. Um, that's uh, uh, you know it, it had better have been fun too because you know that that novel was over 200,000 words. So and I'm. Uh, Working on the next one now, uh, so I'm still enjoying it. Um, yeah, it's a, you know peeling away the different uh, layers there, uh, seeing how reverse engineering uh, uh, Alexander Dumas' novels, like we used to reverse engineer uh, coin-operated arcade games. Um, that's a real interesting challenge. That's that's what I'm doing for my side projects these days. And for those that might not be aware of this, uh, he, uh, Lawrence has translated a. The Red Sphinx, which is the sequel to The Three Musketeers. I knew about the one called 20 Years Later or 20 Years After, but this is a completely different one. Uh, that has been out of, it's been, been unavailable in English for over a century. I mean, first of all, that to me is incredible that somebody hasn't done, hasn't translated this one already, right, long, long before this. But secondly, <laughs> I'm really, really looking forward to getting my hands on a copy of this. Well, it has a really interesting publication history. It was... Uh written very late in Dumas' career. It was his next to last book. Um, and uh, he was ailing at the time, and the uh, uh, he wrote everything for serial publication in weekly newspapers, of course. That was, uh, that was how it was done at the time in the mid-19th century. That's how Dickens did it. That's how Dumas did it. Um, and uh, the uh, publication, the newspaper that he was writing for in Paris, uh, went out of business in the middle of 1866. Uh, right, like three quarters of the way through the uh, 
uh, through the novel. Um, and uh, Dumas was sick, and uh, he wasn't really sure how he was going to end it, and so he didn't. Uh, it was left incomplete. Um, but I, in my research, discovered that he had uh, written a novella about the same characters 15 years earlier uh, that took place after the period of the uh, the novel, which is uh, direct directly occurs right after the Three Musketeers, um, that wraps up their story. Um, so I found a, uh, an alternative ending, as it were, to this novel um, that, uh, that, that provides a, uh, a really quite dramatic and uh, appropriate conclusion to the story. Uh, so that uh, for the first time, really, we have uh, in the Red Sphinx, uh, in the version that will be published in January, uh, that complete version of that book, um, because it was never uh, was never completed in Dumas' lifetime, uh, and has never been uh, uh, published in that way before. Just on a, on a related note, I also ordered your your swashbush, uh, swashbuckling uh, story collection. I'll post a link to that too. I mean, this this whole Musketeers thing, though, too, I've, I love that era, you know, of adventuring and, and those those tales. I wonder why there haven't been more games made that would let you role play, you know, a musketeer. I mean, to me, <laughs> I would be totally on, on that in a heartbeat. Uh, well, there've been a few, uh, there've been a few. It's a, uh, it's a period that's not, you know, early modern European history, just post Renaissance. It's not necessarily that well known to Americans. Uh, you know, what, they're not, they're not sure what kind of fun they're going to have there, uh, compared to, uh, compared to other things and, uh, historical adventure, uh, those kind of swashbucklers um, have largely been s absorbed into and superseded in the market uh, in the last few decades by uh, uh, by adventure fantasies, by uh, 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 sword and sorcery and fantasy fiction uh, uh, in the wake of uh, Tolkien and such like. So that's where that's where you go to read stories about people with swords nowadays. All right, a bit of a side note here, but something I thought was was kind of cool. Uh, so I noticed one of the, in one of the videos you talked about, or, or they were asking you about how to pronounce things, and you're, you're sort of the one that they go to when they want to find out, well, how do you actually pronounce this word? <laughs> and the reason I'm thinking of this, just as uh, somebody who likes to read fantasy and dabble in writing it occasionally, you know, you, you kind of want to come up with original, cool-sounding names for things, right? Uh, but on the other hand, somebody eventually has to has to pronounce it, and you don't want everybody pronouncing all these words differently, you know, so how do you sort of walk that line, I guess, between being creative with a name and a spelling, but and yet uh, actually being able to pronounce it? Well, it's my job uh, on Elder Scrolls Online as the lore master um, to be an expert in all of these imaginary cultures that we have in Tamriel. Uh, and in fact, the, over the 20 plus years that, that Elder Scrolls games have been, been produced, uh, a great deal of information on the in the background uh, has been generated about these different cultures, including their languages, their their uh, their naming practices, um, their uh, 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 the accents that they speak in, that kind of stuff. Um, so, in order to keep it all consistent, uh, which is one of my tasks. Um, we actually have a uh, our audio department uh, has a has a little uh, little app that uh, that they use when they're in the studio recording voice actors, um, uh, whereby uh, every single proper word I have already recorded how it's to be pronounced, uh, and all they have to do is click on it, and my little voice speaks, and then the actor knows how to say that. Uh, so that way we uh, we get all of the uh, the wacky. Uh, invented uh, languages uh, to sound consistent, uh, you know. And in the wake of Tolkien, you got to do that. Guy was a linguist, um, so uh, everybody expects uh, their fantasy worlds are going to be linguistically uh, 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 consistent and uh, and appropriate. So um, that's how we do that. Just out of curiosity, what what's sort of the wackiest and hardest to pronounce word <laughs> oh, well, not, in the Elder Scrolls uh, universe? Uh, it, that would be uh, proper names and uh, proper words in the Dwarven language, the Deep Elves, the Dwemer, uh, because they're, they're, 
their language consists primarily of consonants. Uh, so, and, and uh, you know, with the occasional uh, sibilants thrown in. Uh, and so figuring out how to, how to pronounce those, you know, uh, uh, lift and things like that. That's, I mean, it's a relatively simple one. Um, you, you have to, you have to break it down and figure out, I'm going to have to insert some, I just got to put some vowels in here, aren't I? Uh, where am I going to put those? Um, so that, uh, so that people in the studio can actually say these words and say them consistently and say them the same. Uh, yeah. It's, it's the damn dwarves. It must be a lot of fun in the studio on those days when you got actors trying to struggle with the <laughs> pronunciation. They're they're usually up to the challenge. Uh, they uh, they 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 and those voice actors, man, they earn their money. <laughs> they do a great job. We really enjoy having a fully voiced game. Well, thanks so much, Lawrence, for taking the time out to chat with me. Really, really appreciate it. I mean, you're a guy that's got so many different creative projects going on all over the place. I mean, where's the best place for, for viewers to go if they want to keep tabs on you? You can go to my website, uh, swashbucklingadventure.net. Um, and there you can find all, all about the Red Sphinx and the big book of Swashbuckling Adventure and uh, uh, the games I'm working on, things I've done in the past. Uh, it's all referenced on there. All right, I think that'll do it. Thanks again. My pleasure, anytime. Yeah, it's been lots of fun. I hope to have you on again in the future. Uh, yeah, you know, after another uh, another 30 years, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll have some more stuff to talk about. Hello and welcome. This is a reading of Chapter 23 of Vintage Games 2.0, an insider look at the most influential games of all time. Be read by the author, yours truly, Matt Barton. Now, if you like this chapter, please go to uh, the CRC Press website or to Amazon and buy a copy of the book. I think you'll really enjoy it. Now, the reason I chose Chapter 23, SimCity, I really like this game for one thing, but I think it's got a really good story that I think you'll enjoy. And plus, it's a story that hasn't been told nearly as often as some of the other games in the book, uh, such as uh, <laughs> Doom or... Uh, Street Fighter 2 or Super Mario Brothers. So uh, maybe it, maybe there's uh, something in this chapter you haven't heard before, even if you are a fan of the SimCity series. Anyway, without further ado, uh, without further ado, that is, uh, let's get started. Would you know a great game if you played it? Maybe you would. But we've already seen several instances where even the savviest publishers said no thanks to a smash hit. One cringeworthy example occurred at a trade show in 1980, where marketing executives were offered their chance of four Namco arcade games, King and Balloon, Tank Battalion, Rally X, and Pac-Man. You'd think that anyone would have known Pac-Man was something special, but that's the benefit of hindsight. Midway's president, David Marofsky, shared Namco's opinion that Rally X was by far the best in show. In Marofsky's defense, quote, strategic multiplayer racing game, unquote, sounded much better on paper than, quote, wedge-shaped creature gobbles pallets as monsters pursue him through a maze, unquote. If Pac-Man's premise seemed ludicrous, imagine a game about adjusting tax rates, assigning zones for development, and laying water pipes, streets, and power lines. How could any of that possibly be fun? There wasn't even a clear way to win or lose. You just played until you got bored and started over again. I told people I was going to do a game about city planning, said the game's designer, Will Wright, who was then 25 years old. They'd just look at me, roll their eyes, and say something somewhat dubiously, Oh, good, Will. You go do that. Uh, the quote, unmarketable, unquote, concept only made sense to Wright, who'd gotten into the business after giving up, temporarily at least, on his dream of building robots and colonies in space. But there was one dream he couldn't let go of. One idea his colleagues could not quite convince him was stupid. One tiny sim who would not do as he was told. Then and now, most games are based on activities that are just intrinsically fun, such as pinball or Tetris, or those that immerse us in exciting scenarios, like fighting, racing, or exploring. We play these games to escape from reality. We dream of being lion tamers, not chartered accountants. Will has a reality distortion field around him, 
said his friend and business partner, Jeff Braun. He comes up with the craziest idea you've ever heard. And when he's finished explaining it to you, the world looks crazy. He's the only sane person in it. Wright's idea was brilliant, but it was one of the toughest sells in the history of the industry. Wright's interest in the video game industry began in the early 1980s, after he bought an Apple II and played Bill Budge's pinball construction set and Nasser Jabelli's games. He was inspired by, by uh, Bruce Artwick's flight simulator, but it wasn't so much the plane as the world around it. For the first time, there was this consistent, microscopic little world. It just amazed me, he said. Wright also singles out Dan Gorland's Choplifter game as an influence. This was a great 2D helicopter game that had you shooting tanks, planes, and rescuing hostages. As we'll see, helicopters were never far from Wright's mind. He cherished the memories of flying in them with his father, who died when Wright was only nine years old. His dad had never told his son that his ideas were crazy or misguided. Instead, he had sat with him on many a night, pointing up at stars and wondering what sort of creatures might live there. Wright's father was gone from the earth, but the stars were still there. The program that had the strongest impact on Wright's life and his career was not really a game at all, but rather a simulation. It was John Horton Conway's Game of Life, a simulation of cellular automation that dated back to 1970. It was based on four simple rules, algorithms, that determined the growth or decay of the cellular system, life at its most abstract. The game of life was fascinating back then, and it's fascinating now. With so little input, the computer spawns wondrously complex, elegant, beautiful patterns, spaces of the possible. Wright became obsessed with the game of life and spent a year programming versions of it in Pascal and later machine language. As Wright's confidence grew in his programming, he decided the time was right to try making his own game. He knew his Apple II inside and out, but the Commodore 64, the most popular computer the world had ever seen, was the surest route to success. He bought one and set to work learning to code it, and like many Apple II programmers, found it painfully deficient, like typing with one hand. Wright found the situation intolerable, so he built an interface that allowed him to program on his Apple II and then run his code on the Commodore. It wasn't an elegant solution, but it worked. And good enough is the mantra of every wealthy programmer. Of course he would choose to make his first game about helicopters. However, this would be much more than a choplifter clone. Instead, he'd use Conway's Game of Life algorithms to simulate a dynamic virtual world, a quote, world large enough to get lost in, as he described it. At a time when most designers would have been satisfied just to have a smoothly scrolling tiled background, Wright wanted a working ecosystem, or a clockwork universe, as he put it. The world he created for his game was a group of islands. Boats traveled between them, delivering resources to tanks on the islands, which would transport them to the six factories the player was tasked with destroying. The factories were defended by turrets, tanks, and fighters, and the factories would expend resources to rebuild any that were destroyed. Meanwhile, the scientists in the factories were furiously developing more advanced technologies, such as heat-seeking missiles. Broderbon, who had brought out Choplifter in 1982, published Raid on Bungling Bay in 1984 as a sequel of sorts. The Bungling Empire introduced in that game was carried over to maintain some continuity it also had appeared in Douglas E. Smith's Load Runner. They ported it to the Nintendo Entertainment System and MSX a year later. Critics were impressed with both the graphics and the movement, but few even mentioned its greatest innovation, the one for which Wright was so proud, the clockwork universe. It was totally opaque to people, said Wright. He blamed himself. He didn't even depict the resources the boats collected, thus masking the entire process. It was a failure of design, not concept, but he still earned, quote, enough money to live on for several years. Like Bill Budge, Will Wright had more fun making his game than he did playing it. This was especially true of his game world. 
quote, I was more interested in creating the buildings on the islands than in blowing them up, unquote. However, just putting up buildings on a map wasn't much of a game. There was something missing. He talked it over with his next door neighbor, who happened to be the city planner for Oakland, California. He gave him a copy of Urban Dynamics, a controversial book by J. Wright Forrester, the father of system dynamics. The book's argument was that city managers tend to treat symptoms rather than the actual causes of a problem. To get at the real causes, we have to dig much deeper into a system's structures and policies, often a group of three or more interacting feedback loops. These complex relationships were much too difficult for a human to fathom, but a computer could simulate its behavior, revealing its true characteristics. It was heady stuff, but perfect thought fodder for Wright, who'd always been an eclectic and fervent reader. Another key influence was a short story by Polish author Stanislaw Lem called The Seventh Sally, in which a robot builds a miniature kingdom whose description could serve for SimCity. Quote, it was only a model after all, a process with a large number of parameters, a simulation, a mock-up for a monarch to practice on with the necessary feedback variables multistats, unquote. The robot in the story made his simulation a little too perfect. The tiny citizens eventually became self-aware and turned on their new master, who'd become a despot. Much like the countless fans of his game, few of whom could long resist a temptation to unleash disaster on their city just for the fun of it. Wright spent the next year adapting Forrester and Lim's ideas into a playable game for the Commodore 64, a formidable task given that machine's limitations. In the meantime, the Macintosh, Amiga, and Atari ST had popularized the graphical user interface, and Wright tried his best to apply these concepts, as well as multitasking, into a program he called Micropolis, which he completed in 1985. Though it lacked many of the features of the later versions, it was already an impressive achievement. Wright himself was proud of the unpredictable citizens that populated his virtual city, the Sims. They don't obey, said Wright, and that's what makes it fun. You keep trying to keep this city together, but it keeps falling apart. You have a certain amount of control, but there's a certain amount of entropy of the system, and it's balanced just right. It's life at the edge of chaos. Shit happens. Much like the despot and Lim's story, players could spend hours manipulating the variables, then sit back to witness the long-term effects of their playing god. Unfortunately, Broderbond was baffled by the open-ended design. They kept saying, where's the ending? When do you win or lose? They wanted to have an election where you got kicked out of office or not. And I was like, no, it's even more fun if you're doing it badly. And they just parked it. They decided they weren't going to release it. He fared no better with other publishers who simply couldn't imagine anyone actually wanting to play a game about city building. In 1986, Wright attended a pizza party thrown by investor Jeff Braun. Braun had made his fortune with a business that made factory floor automation systems, but after learning about the Commodore Amiga, quote, decided it was going to change the world and invited a bunch of game developers in hopes of snagging a few into a new venture. When Braun asked Wright what kind of games he made, the despondent developer sighed, you won't like the games I make. They're really bad. Braun was eventually able to coax Wright into showing him his game, and unlike the executives at Broderbund, he immediately recognized the game's potential. It was a breakout, something I had never seen before, said Braun, who partnered with Wright to, to uh, develop it for the Amiga and other computers under their own label, Maxis. Broderbund reluctantly agreed to distribute the product, but only after they had added scenarios based on historical cities. Hamburg of 1944, Detroit in 1972, etc. Braun, like Trip Hawkins of Electronic Arts, was wrong about the Amiga. A few years later, it was all but irrelevant. As the weeks crept into months after SimCity hit the streets, it looked as though he was wrong about it, too. It was a, such a strange thing. Nobody knew what to make of it, said Braun. 
If the sluggish cells weren't worrisome enough, he was soon the target of a lawsuit by Toho, the Japanese film company, who claimed the unnamed monster in SimCity impinged on their Godzilla trademarks. And this might have been the end of Maxis and SimCity were it not for a full-page review that appeared in Newsweek. The reviewer, Beer, uh, Bill Barrel, sums up the game's appeal quite aptly. Quote, Control. The exhilarating ability to manipulate an environment, maybe even their own environment, by proxy of imagination. In a world where cities seem to have ungovernable lives of their own, that's a gift. Unquote. It was the first time Newsweek had ever published a game review, and it sent the game sales through the roof. By 1992, it had sold more than a million copies, and Russell Seip, the publisher of Computer Gaming World, proclaimed it had, quote, changed the face of computer entertainment software. Further critical acclaim followed. In 1989, there was no award we didn't get, said Braun. The appeal went well beyond traditional gamer circles. It soon found its way into classrooms, government offices, labs, executive boardrooms, and, of course, architect and design studios. The Journal, the biggest newspaper in Rhode Island, had the five candidates for mayor play the game as a test of their fitness for office. Most failed spectacularly, but Vincent Cianci, who, quote, solved a housing crunch, avoided new taxes, and left office with a small budget surplus, unquote, did end up winning the election. Wright didn't rest on his laurels and immediately went to work with Sim Earth, the living planet. It put players in control of a planetary ecosystem, which they could affect by altering its temperature, atmosphere, and land masses, and then observe how these conditions influence the evolution of living organisms. It was based on another of Wright's informal scholarly pursuits, James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis. The hypothesis describes the Earth itself as a living organism. Its organs are living and non-living entities that interact in powerful and dynamic ways. Lovelock himself contributed to the game's manual, a 212-page document loaded with facts, theories, and cheesy one-liners. Is this a random world, or did you plan it? Corny jokes aside, the game's steep learning curve and complex interface, described in the manual as a planetary spreadsheet, turned away those looking for a SimCity successor, and it wasn't nearly as successful. Next up was Sim Ant, released in 1991. This ant colony simulation attracted more attention than Sim Earth, probably because of its more intuitive interface and appealing subject matter. A lifelong ant lover, Wright was inspired this time by ant expert E.O. Wilson, whose massive book, The Ants, is considered the definitive work on the subject and was richly influential in, e in ecology and in sociobiology. Wright read this and all of Wilson's other works, and uh, Wright took the chance to interview him for NPR's Open Mic program in 2009 and discovered a mutual admiration. When asked if he thought there was a place for games in education, Wilson responded that, quote, games are the future in education. I envision visits to different ecosystems that the student could actually enter, taking this path, going to that hill, with an instructor. I hope I'll meet you sometime, maybe walking together through a Jurassic forest. I'll start working on it, said Wright. Wright followed Sim Ant with an even more abstract title called Sim Life, which focused again on ecosystems, but this time players could modify the genetic code of plants and animals. Wright would return to this theme in 2008 with Spore. In 1993, Maxis released Sim Farm, a game that, as the title suggests, had players managing a farm. Sim Life, Missions in the Rainforest, followed in 1995, an unsuccessful game by Matthew Stibb. None of these spin-offs achieved anywhere near the popularity of the original, which finally received a true sequel, SimCity 2000, in 1993. This game marked a great leap forward in audiovisuals, with the city now shown in isometric perspective instead of the top-down view of the original. The angled perspective made these structures look more three-dimensional. Taller buildings visibly looked taller. The sequel also added many new structures, such as subways, airports, and seaports. 
While the new features pleased fans and critics, others were more impressed with the SimCity Urban Renewal Kit, which allowed players to alter the in-game images to represent particular buildings or, st or, or settings. The award-winning game was another crowd-pleaser from Axis and is considered the best of the series by many aficionados. Despite the financial success of SimCity 2000, Wright himself was tired of doing Sim games. Instead, he spent several fruitless months designing a free-form adventure game with a flight simulator based on the Hindenburg airship disaster. Wright eventually scrapped the ill-conceived project, fearing that some might think he was a Nazi sympathizer. The German LZ-129 Hindenburg did have giant swastikas on its tail fins. It took a game based on his old flame, Helicopters, to bring Wright back to the table. Simcopter, 1996, was a 3D game that put you in the cockpit of a helicopter soaring over a simulated city. Gameplay consisted of redirecting traffic, apprehending criminals, fighting fires, performing daring rescues, and transporting people to and fro. You could even import maps from SimCity 2000. It was also the first appearance of Simlish, the fictional language of The Sims. The last SimCity game that Wright himself designed was SimCity 3000, whose development began in 1996. By this point, first-person shooters with 3D graphics were all the rage, and it seemed to make sense to bring SimCity into the third dimension. Sam Poole, a former sales executive with no game development experience, was now running Maxis and promising, quote, photorealistic 3D graphics and an enhanced simulation model, unquote. All this in time for Christmas. Unfortunately, uh, this challenge proved far more formidable than Maxis anticipated, and all they had to show for their efforts at A3 a month later was a brief trailer with blocky, outmoded graphics. Soon after this dismal showing, Maxis was acquired by Electronic Arts, and Luke Barthelay became the general manager. He moved decisively, gutting the staff and reducing SimCity 3000 back to two dimensions. The resulting product may not have been 3D, but it looked great in 2D and did offer more sophisticated choices. Naturally, there were more structures to build, which now included farms and wastewater management services. Players could also interact with neighboring cities to work out business deals or purchase services. There was also a greater emphasis on land values. A jazzy score by Jerry Martin rounded out the package. Electronic Arts published SimCity 4 in 2003, which was also warmly received. Unlike the previous games, which focused on a single city, this time the planning was at a regional level with interactions between neighboring cities. The latest entry in the series was confusingly titled SimCity. Unofficially, it's known as SimCity 5. This 2013 release was a high-profile disaster for Maxis and Electronic Arts, caused mostly by the decision to require an online connection to a persistent universe. It wasn't necessarily a bad idea, but there were many issues in practice. Like many other players, I had trouble logging in and staying connected when I did. Uh, to soothe bitter tempers, EA gave owners a free game and made the online connection optional but the damage was done. In March of 2015, EA shut down Maxis's studio in Emeryville, where the SimCity games were made. SimCity inspired plenty of games from rival companies eager to cash in on the city management craze. One of the earliest and most successful was David Lester's Caesar game, which was popular enough to warrant three sequels. As the title implies, the series had players managing cities in ancient Rome rather than modern times. Other rivals focused on the business side of things, such as Trevor Chan's Capitalism Game, which put players in charge of a major corporation. Phil Steinmeier's Tropico series has also proven quite successful, combining the familiar city-building aspects with political and cultural satire. The latest of these, Tropico 5, was published in 2014. Other SimCity-inspired games are the Tycoon and Empire series, uh, such as Sid Meier's Railroad Tycoon or Chan's Restaurant Empire. There are a dozen of these themes to choose from, including hospitals, theme parks, and zoos. Sometimes Peter Molyneux's Populous game is mistakenly lumped in with such games. 
However, this game had players in the role of a god, not a mayor or park manager. A substantial difference, I'd argue. Furthermore, the player doesn't decide what to build where, but rather raises and lowers land tiles to facilitate settlement by your minions or followers. Gradually, their devotion grants you divine powers to create, well, acts of God, and also to promote followers to higher ranks. Honestly, it deserves its own chapter in a book like this, but suffice it to say, it has in many ways been an equally brilliant and influential game. We'll come back to Wright when we talk about his greatest game, The Sims, in Chapter 32. Playing SimCity Today Purists should try SimCity for the Commodore 64, which was the first version and also the simplest. Unless you have a C64 lying around, though, you'll need an emulator. I recommend Cloanto's C64 Forever. However, the later versions for MS-DOS, Amiga, and other platforms have superior audio visuals and more features. A great option for modern PCs and free is Micropolis, an open source version of the original SimCity by Don Hopkins. You can download a copy or play it online at micropolis.mostka.com. That's micropolis.mostka.com. And there you have it, folks. That was Chapter 23 of Vintage Games 2.0, an insider look at the most influential games of all time. Hope you enjoyed this reading. Uh, and if you did, please consider buying a copy of the book. Again, you can get it from uh, the publisher page. If you go to CRC Press uh, or just go to Amazon or your favorite uh, online bookseller, and I'm sure you'll find it. Uh, thanks uh, again. And please, if you do read the book and enjoy it, consider posting a review on Amazon. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, remember, there will, will be uh, links in the show notes to, if you want to uh, look at Lawrence uh, Schick, a.k.a. Lawrence Ellsworth, uh, his books and his uh, other projects. I'll put a link to that, as well as a link to uh, where you can purchase Vintage Games 2.0. Now, it has been a little cheaper on, on the uh, CRC Press website, than, the, than Amazon for whatever reason, but uh, regardless of whether, uh, where you purchase it or if you got a copy for free, uh, please uh, go to Amazon and write a review. Uh, it really makes a big difference in getting it uh, ranked in the Amazon search engine and I would really appreciate it, so uh, thanks. And as always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much for your support of this show. Uh, it's entirely uh, your uh, contributions, your help that keeps this show in production. I uh, owe it all to you. Uh, if you would like to become a supporter of the show, just go to that link in the show notes. There's one to Patreon. Uh, you can also go to mattchat.us. And all I ask is uh, a buck a show. Uh, so if you like the show, you want to see more episodes like this, more interviews with people like with uh, uh, people like Mr. Uh, Lawrence Schick, uh, then a buck a show. You know, that's all I ask. Just go to the link in the show notes, and I think you'll like the show much more uh, if you do that. So once again, thank you very, very, very much. It really means a lot to me. All right, uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Okay, first off, I guess I should say uh, that if you want to play Elder Scrolls online, no, I ask a lot of you guys if you're playing this game or not, and uh, some people played it a little bit when it came out. Other people uh, saw some the sort of mixed reviews that were out uh, right around when it came out. Uh, but anyway, not very many people are playing it. Some are. Uh, but anyway, I tried it out. I'm actually thinking about doing an episode on it. Uh, right now, if you want to play it, uh, you can go to you can get it from Steam. Twenty-nine dollars ninety-nine cents for the Tamriel Unlimited. And uh, with this, there's no monthly subscription, but uh, this is something I've learned uh, pretty quickly playing it. If you do subscribe, it's $15 a month, somewhere in that uh, vicinity. Uh, then you get a crafting bag, and you're like, what, what's that? <laughs> Basically, it makes your inventory uh, headaches go away, because all the stuff you use for crafting just goes into this sort of huge bag. Uh, so I, I took care of all my inventory issues, which is the main thing that was aggravating me about the game. Uh, plus some other perks, but that's what really, <laughs> you know, it's worth $15 a month to me not to have to 
uh, go back to town all the time and, and try to deal with that. So uh, anyway, a uh, bunch of other perks you get with that, experience points, bonuses, and whatnot. But if you want to, you could just play, you could pay the 30 bucks and that's it. Uh, let's see, uh, what else? Oh, uh, I was going to say too, uh, with this, I, I've got about 90 hours into it and I've yet to partner up with anybody. I'm just completely solo playing this thing and actually having a pretty good time doing that. Uh, so I think that's a pretty good sign. Uh, so even if you don't really do a lot of MMO type stuff, you don't like the ideas of being in a party and all that stuff, you might still enjoy uh, Elder Scrolls Online, at least uh, 30 bucks worth, you know, let me put it that way. All right, other news, uh, Stig uh, wrote in about Diablo 2 HD. Now this was a real fiasco. You kind of wonder what the hell's wrong with people. Uh, they, they put up this mock, somebody somewhere put up this mock site, claimed that Diablo 2 is getting this HD remake. Got a lot of people really excited. And then uh, turns out just to be a hoax. Uh, Blizzard said they had nothing to do with this, wasn't their site. Uh, so it's just all a big hoax, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so pretty sad news. It's kind of sad uh, for people that are Diablo 2 fans, but also just sad that somebody would think that was funny. You know, I don't, I don't get it, but uh, anyway. Uh, another bit of news. Uh, there's a game called Steam Hammer. Now, uh, this has uh, been greenlit on Steam. You can check it out. Uh, they got some videos up there. Uh, it's the uh, first hardcore sandbox RPG featuring survival elements. <laughs> that is set in the dark and mysterious steampunk world of Sayol. Uh, so there's a lot to this game. Uh, they're making a lot about the fact that you have a steam jetpack. Uh, so kind of look, just watching the uh, footage, kind of reminding me of the old Tribes game a little bit. Uh, but this of course has airships. Uh, it's sort of got that steampunk vibe, you know what that is. A free PVP for 64 players with a non-target combat system. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, you can also build things in there. Uh, even uh, flying leviathans and steam motorcycles. So it sounds like they've got some really good ideas. And the team there is uh, from Belarus and uh, Russia, uh, from three different time zones. Uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, so I think that will uh, do it for the news. Uh, now what about that uh, drink of the week? Uh, well this week I've got a, uh, keeping up with my Halloween theme we've been doing here lately, this is a horrific Jones Cane Sugar Soda Blood Orange Soda. A scary, delicious treat from the folks at Jones. Uh, this was uh, got a nice little mummy on the cover. It will haunt you forever. Uh, so it says, even though you're too old to dress up like a superhero and ask strangers for candy. That's kind of debatable. That's kind of ageist, isn't it? Uh, uh, anyway, uh, you never really outgrow Halloween. Uh, that's why the mad scientist at Jane's Soda brewed up this tasty potion. Drink it straight or mix it up. Either way, the trick is to treat yourself. And don't forget, always look under the bed before going to sleep. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Jones Soda, I'm assuming you've probably heard of them before. I'm trying to remember, where are these guys out of? Uh, I, I see these everywhere. Let's see, Hanford Street, Seattle, Washington. Okay, now it says they're a product of Canada. So bottled in Washington, product of Canada. Not really sure what the full scoop is there, but <laughs> anyway, for God's sake, uh, let's open up this uh, blood orange soda and see what it's all about. All right, so I'm hanging out here with this horrific Jones uh, blood orange soda here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Well, you definitely smell that orange. Kind of reminds me of one of those old sun-kissed uh, orange soda drinks. A little bit more of a, I'd say more of a tangerine uh, aroma than a blood orange, though. Uh, anyway, it smells really good. As soon as you smell this, you instantly want to taste it. And so that's always, I think, what you're going for with the aroma. Uh, let's give it a taste, though. Well... You definitely taste that blood orange. It's actually got a very fresh sort of blo uh, blood orange uh, taste to it. Uh, kind of a little bit almost like a grapefruit, if you can imagine. Some, somewhere between a grapefruit and a, a really succulent orange is kind of what I'm uh, tasting here. Uh, it's, a it's a little bit sweet, but not overpowering with the sweetness. I think they kind of nailed it uh, just where you want that uh, sweetness level to be with this. Um, I'll try it again here.
you know, I'm, I'm really uh, liking this. There's lots of very interesting flavors going on. Uh, it's not so tart or sour or something like that that it's, it's painful. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, it really sort of gets, gets your attention. I mean, this is not something you're going to uh, want to chug. You know, you want to enjoy this, all the different sort of flavors and uh, uh, sort of aromas and aftertaste going on here. It's actually uh, quite nice. I think the sort of blood orange instead of just a straight up orange was a good choice because this way you, you slow down a little bit because you're like, whoa, what's that? <laughs> and that's slightly, a, you know, if you had a blood orange, you know, it doesn't taste like a regular orange. And that's sort of what I'm getting uh, here. So, you know, really good. Uh, a good combination. I'll try it one more time. I think I know what the rating is going to be, though. Yeah, this is a you know a really good choice. I'm really impressed with this. Um, I would say I would go for this over one of those old Sunkist or a lot of the other sort of orangey sodas out there. Now, I like this one because it's not so sugary sweet. Instead, you really taste that orange, and it's got just enough sweetness to where it's it's more like a soda. You know, you wouldn't mistake this for for juice or something. Uh, so they really just sort of nailed that. Uh, I really enjoy this. I'm going to give this a full 5 out of 5 uh, drinking horns. If you're looking for some kind of blood orange soda, uh, I think this is the one you want. Uh, the uh, Jones Horrific Cane Sugar Soda. Uh, really, really good stuff. 5 out of 5 drinking horns on it. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotes by Alexander Dumas. And he's got some really good ones. Uh, but I narrowed it down to this one goes something like this. Beware of generalizations, even this one. See you guys next week. Because I made it good. Good. <laughs>